Good morning. I say pleasant morning greetings also to our friends who are joining us online and our brothers and sisters and friends at the male and female dormitory. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. This morning, we are going to continue our series on the fourfold gospel or what we want to call in the Kamakop, the distinctives of Kamakop. And of course, you know this. It's up there. Our... Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, there. Our distinctives have four, is fourfold. We have the Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King. Last week, Pastor, or uh, rather, Brother Vic Pabellion started the series on the Savior. This time, by no, uh, by, by design, we're going to actually continue with sanctification. Let, later, you will understand why sanctification has to come after Savior. Okay? The sanctifier comes after the Savior. Well, before that, let's go to our uh, scripture reading for this morning, after which we'll do our opening prayer and I'll be reading from John chapter 17, verse 13 to, 20, to 19. Again, John 17, 13 to 19. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy with them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that you take them out of the world, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are of the world even as I am not, they are not of the world even if I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. May God bless this uh, reading of the word, which is actually the prayer of Jesus. Shall we pray also? Our Father, our God, we thank you for this morning that despite the rains, we have people here in the sanctuary where we can gather together, have fellowship, and listen to your word. Lord, it is our prayer this morning that when we depart from this place, we shall have been blessed with a deeper understanding of our relationship with you and, our, um, and that we will be blessed to serve you more and love you more. So I lift up, Lord, this message to you as well as each and every one of us, even as we pray that it would be your Holy Spirit who will make us understand and it will be the same Spirit who will empower us to live the life you want us to live. So we leave this uh, morning up to you, especially this message. May it glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Jesus, our sanctifier. Among the four symbols of Jesus, this is the one that is... I would say least understood or the one that takes a little more in-depth study. Why? Because other sects or uh, denominations or groups within the Christian community have different emphasis on what it is to be sanctified. Stated in another way, they have another emphasis on how it is to be filled by the Holy Spirit. They say that you have to manifest certain acts, you have to manifest certain attitudes in order to be convinced that you really are filled with the Holy Spirit. So it is my desire this morning that we look at the Word and we look at practical aspects or perspectives to help us understand what sanctification really is. Okay? First of all, a little clarification that is not a cup. That is a laver. Now, what is a laver? If you see there, it looks like a cup, a chalice, if you will. However, 
the labor is this. Looks like a cup, but much bigger. It is a labadahan. This is not where you wash your clothes, but this is where you cleanse yourself ceremonially if you were a priest during the time of Moses and the tabernacle. And this is where you perform the ceremonies or the rituals before you can enter the place of meetings where you will meet God. So, again, washing. Let's try to understand this. What has washing got to do with sanctification? So, what is a laver? What does it do? The laver was a wash basin used by the priests to wash their hands and feet before entering the tabernacle, which was the presence of the Lord, and to perform acts of worship. Where do we get that? In Exodus 30, 17 to 21, we read that the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of the meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with their water from it. Look at this warning at the last. Whenever they enter the tent of the meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. What? Why will they die if they will not wash? Because if you are ceremonially unclean, you cannot stand the holy presence of God. In the tent of meetings, which is the, where God designated His presence to be felt and to be seen by the people, it is so holy that just by being sinful, you will die in His presence. That is the importance of the sanctification part or the labor that the Lord ordered Moses to do. I did not continue further, but the next verse basically says, and you shall do this from generation to generation. So it is something very important Otherwise, if you come in God's presence in your sinful state, you will die. You will get a little idea of this and understanding of this later as we go along. Okay, to summarize that particular de definitions or that definition, labor is used for cleansing and it is used for sanctifying. Cleansing we understand. Let's not get lost in the definitions now. How about sanctifying? What does it mean? Sanctification is the act of setting something or someone apart as holy and purifying it and dedicating it to God's service. So twofold, setting apart for a purpose and what is that purpose? God's service. Okay? So that is sanctification. Hmm, claro na? Hindi pa rin. Okay. Sanctification stated otherwise is separation from sin and separation to God or for God. Okay? Now, try to understand this twofold uh, description. Savior, actually the saving aspect of Jesus separated us from sin. That's what God, Christ's death on the cross, did for us. But the work of the Lord, as far as salvation was concerned, was done. But His overall plan was not done. He wanted to set aside His people for His glory, for His service, for the good of all mankind. And that's where the sanctification from, uh, comes from. So if you are separated from sin, that is being saved. If you are being separated for God, service, that is sanctification. Where do we get that? In 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, we read, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. That is the purpose of God for dying on the cross because no matter what man will do, he will never be good enough to make himself holy. He will always be in his sin. 
No matter how good, intelligent, rich, famous, or whatever you think you are, you will never be good by yourself to try to reach God. That's why Jesus had to die. Because if Jesus, uh, if you are able to do it, or we are able to do it, Jesus did not have to come, right? If any one of us, just one, could actually save himself, then the rest of us could do it. But the truth is, no one could do it. That's why Jesus came. And what it attained was that it allowed us to be declared holy just as God is holy and therefore we can be together with Him. And that is the ministry of grace. We did not deserve it, but God did it anyway. Okay? More emphasis on that in another message, but you know what I mean. Grace is unmerited favor. We did not deserve to be saved. God saved us anyway. He wanted us to be holy again, just as His original plan was. So that's separation from sin. How about separation to God? In Revelation 1.6, He made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father. Okay? So there is the service part. We were separated to be a kingdom and to be priests to serve His God and Father, basically to bring others to Him also. Now, the Savior and Sanctifier, as I was describing earlier, they actually come together. In John 1, 29 and 33, we read that Jesus is the one who is taking away the sins of the world and the sanctifying part, the one who is baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Lest you be confused with the word baptizing there. Baptizing is to be identified with Christ. When you are baptized, you make the choice to be identified with Christ, a public declaration saying, I am obeying Christ to be baptized and therefore I am now identified with Christ. And when you are identified with Christ, you are saying, I am ready to be used of Him and by Him and for Him. So, Savior and Sanctifier. It is curious that, as I said, these two actually come together. But don't be confused, huh? The saving part was done all by Jesus, by Himself. All we had to do was accept his grace, his gift, which was free, and it's ours. Salvation is ours. But the sanctifying part, which is very much a part of his plan for us, needs our active participation. Now let's try to see and understand the correlation between salvation and sanctification through comparisons and distinctions. Okay, let's start. I have four here. In, sal in salvation, we talk about deliverance from the penalty of sin. In sanctification, we talk about deliverance from the power of sin. I'm sure all of us here has wondered, after receiving Christ, why am I still sinning? Although not many in the world can see it, but in my own heart, I know I am sinning. I entertain lustful thoughts, I entertain... Uh, motives that are not pure, I entertain things that are not glorifying to God, and sometimes I even act it out. That is the power of sin over us. Though we were delivered from the penalty of sin in the dying death of Christ on the cross, or dying sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the next chapter should be for us to be delivered from the power of sin. And that is the sanctification part. Gets na? Konti? Na? Nagiging klaro na. Also, if salvation is freedom, freedom from death, sanctification is freedom to live. I like this. When I saw this, I said, wow, nice. Because sometimes we think that after we are saved, tapos na ang storya. Yes, tapos na ang storya as far as being saved is concerned. But we're still alive. We're still in this world. We're still here for a purpose. Hindi naman pwede yung 
all of us after receiving Christ, eh sabihin natin, we proclaim, pwede na akong mamatay. Tapos na. I, I'm really tickled by this uh, expression because um, my cousin who studied in Manila was talking about different cultures and how we perceive things. No? This was way back in the 80s. When he met somebody from up north, probably an Ilocano, his classmate said, Taga saan ka? Taga Sambuanga. Saan yun? Di ba Mindanao yan? Oo. Ang layo nun na. Paano ka pumarito? Nagbarko ka? Nagbus? O nag-eroplano? Nag-eroplano. Nakasakay ka na ng eroplano? Oo. E di pwede ka nang mamatay. Bucket list. Siguro siya doon sa farm nila, sa saan siya lumaki, he can only look up to the sky and see the jets flying over and he said, I will never get to do that. And if that happens to me, my life is complete. Pwede na akong mamatay. Ganon ba rin ang attitude natin when we realize that we are saved from sin and that we have a ticket to heaven, a ticket and assurance to eternal life, do we say, Pwede na akong mamatay. Actually, yes, pwede na. Pero wag naman, may plano pa si Lord sa'yo. At yun yung sanctification. After you were freed from death, you are now free to live. Not for yourself, but for Him. So that others can have the same opportunity. So the power of sanctification is for you to have a life that is glorifying to God. A life that is full and meaningful. So, there. I think that's enough to say about freedom from death and freedom to live. Also, salvation releases us from the guilt of the past. It releases us from the effects of the sins that we have committed over all these years. In contrast, Sanctification equips us for the temptations of the future. Kaya mo ba ma-overcome yung mga temptations ng sin? Even the sins that you have committed in the past, babalik at babalik yan, lalo na kung favorite sin mo yan. Favorite sin because you keep doing it. Can you have the power to overcome it? The Bible says, yes, that is what Jesus came for. He sets us apart for His service, right? We have read it in the previous verses. Another one, if salvation causes Jesus to live in us, sanctification allows Jesus to live through us. Claro? When you are saved, Jesus lived in you. You asked Him to come into your life. Remember, I opened the door of my life and take you as my Savior and Lord. Diba? He is now in you. He will never leave you. But, unless you allow Him and be sanctified, He will not live through you. You have to make a choice. You have to allow Jesus to live His life through you. And that is sanctification. Now, how to be filled by the Holy Spirit? I take liberty in doing a shortcut of the Campus Crusade for Christ approach to uh, being filled by the Spirit or to be sanctified. I just want to keep this simple so that we can remember it. But if you want an in-depth, more personal Bible study of this, look up in the internet, go to, just type, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you will see their steps on how to appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit. Or if not, hingi kayo ng booklet ki Belly. May ano yan si Belly. How to be filled the, uh, with the Holy Spirit. So, now, <clears throat> how to be filled by the Holy Spirit? How to allow Christ to live His life through you? Just as you breathe naturally without thinking, you exhale what do you exhale? The bad gas, right? Carbon dioxide. You cannot keep that in. If you keep that in, you will die. Excuse me. Sorry. 
I'm, I have a bad back. <laughs> okay. When you exhale, you bring out the bad. And what is the equivalent of that? You confess your sins. And confession involves three things. A-T-R. Agreeing with God that what he calls sin is actually sin. Then you thank God for forgiving you and you repent. You turn around. Change of course of action. So the art of confession is agreeing, repenting, and thanking God. Art na lang para madaling matandaan. The art of confession. Now how about inhaling? Inhaling is breathing in the good air. The oxygen. You need it. Your blood needs it. Your brain needs it. Our organs need it to be sustained. In fact, they say that it only just takes very few minutes, as much as, as little as five minutes for the brain to be deprived of oxygen, and it dies. So that's how important breathing in is, breathing in oxygen. So what is inhaling? It is surrendering the control of your life and appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the tricky part. How do you do that? Madali lang mag-breathe, di ba? Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Pero paano yung, ano yung equivalent, ng spiritual equivalent of inhaling or appropriating the power of the Spirit? We become filled, we have to understand this, that this is both a command and a promise. When God says, do something, we have to do it. It is not an option, it is mandatory. And you have to accept that in the Christian life, when God orders something, it is actually for our own good. It is not his ego tripping to say, just because I ordered it. I know some people who just say, I ordered it, don't question, just follow. Regardless of my motive, basta sundin mo. Obey first, ask questions later. You know, God is not like that. When God orders us to, be, to do something, it is for our own good. He mandated it because it's needed. Because we need it. Otherwise, just as the children or the sons of Aaron who will not wash in the labor, they will die in God's presence. If we don't appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit and disobey the command to be filled, our spiritual life will die. Equivalent testimony. We will be living like the heathen, like the unbelievers. Wala tayong diferensya sa kanila. When people see us, they will even say, akala ko Christian yan. Ba't ganun siya? Ba't nagmumura pa? Ba't hindi uplifting? Ba't nakakainis kung kasama ko? Ba't umiinom pa? Yung mga ganun, of course, we're not trying to judge by mere actions, but we're trying to see the fruit of your life. If you don't feel, get filled by the Holy Spirit, we will die. Our testimony will die. And we will not have accomplished the purpose for which we are put in this world to bring others to Christ too. Somebody said, common friend, Alam mo yan si, ano, si brother so and so. He was the first to share to me. Really? Oh, nag-accept ka? Hindi. Bakit? He was sharing to me over a bottle of beer. Eh, ayoko maniwala sa kanya. Yung mga ganon, you see the irony of it? Okay, so aside from the command, oh wait, let's see. Command and promise. Meron ko niyan, pinagkuhanan. What is the command? Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Yung mga nanliligaw, na, naintindihan nila to. Power mo na, inom mo na bago makaligaw, kasi pag hindi nakainom, hindi makasalita. Nangangatal. Do you know there's something better than that? The Holy Spirit. Look at how Jesus used this parallelism. Do not get drunk, I mean Paul, do not get drunk 
with wine where you intend to get your power but instead get your power from the Holy Spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit, not Spirit of San Miguel. Gets? The power of the Holy Spirit is much, much more powerful than anything you can tap or appropriate. Now, how about the promise? In John 5, 14 to 15, this is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything in accordance with His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from Him. So the question of whether or not will, uh, God will answer your or grant your prayer to be filled is no longer a mystery. He wants it, therefore He will do it if you ask Him, right? I'll tell you a secret for 100% answered prayers. Pray in accordance with His will. Because God wants it, why will He go against Himself? If He says in the Bible, I want this done, and then you pray, Lord, I want to do that, don't you think He will answer that? So we have a double uh, motivation here to be filled. One, God wants it, He commands it. And number two, He will grant it if you ask it. So it's a win-win situation all the time for the Christian. So all we have to do is to want it, is to desire it, to choose it, to be filled by the Spirit. Now, what is the mark of a Spirit-filled person? A Spirit-filled person bears the fruit of the Spirit. Hindi po typographical error yan. Bakit fruit lang, not fruits? Kasi ang sabi sa Galatians 5.22 to 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Hindi po isa-isa nangyayari yun. Sabay-sabay, kaya fruit lang. Parang marang. Yung fruit ba ng marang yung isang seed lang? Hindi, yung kabuuan, di ba? So sa marang, isa dyan love, isa dyan joy, isa peace, patience, kindness. Lahat yan sabay-sabay sa isang fruit. So if you are filled with, your, with the Spirit, you will suddenly realize, I'm joyful. I have circumstances that make me sad, and yet I cannot understand how come I'm okay. That's the fruit of the Spirit. You, have, you feel love. You can love. You have joy. You have peace. Peace that exists even if you have the worst situation in the world. Patience. Humahaba yung patience mo. You can endure things. Kindness. Even if you're in your deepest sorrow, you can still be kind to other people. You don't use it as an excuse to snap at people just because you're angry or just because you're in a bad mood. The Holy Spirit can do that. Goodness, self-control, these are the fruit of the Spirit. I challenge you to look at Galatians 5, 23 later. No? Meditate on this and ask God to grant this to you every day, and I will guarantee you, He will grant it, if you want it in your life. Who doesn't want that, no? Ang kat, 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 uh, kabila niyan is critical spirit, bad mood, negativism, carnality, lustful thoughts. Pili ka, fruit of the spirit or itong mga negative. Your choice. And when you choose well, you obey God, He will grant it. Ito, very important. The mark of a spirit-filled Christian is that he obeys the word, not his feelings. Hmm. I remember Pastor PJ when he was here. Kasi si Pastor PJ is a counselor, di ba? And one of the things he teaches his uh, counselees is don't listen to the feelings. He goes as far as saying and quoting another guy, saying, the throne of the devil is your feelings. 
Why? Because feelings can make you feel or can make you think na yun yung totoo. Let me illustrate in a few moments. Let's say the Word of God says, you are saved. God will never leave you nor forsake you. But here you are, bagsak ka sa exam. Iniwan ka ng boyfriend mo. Or if you're married, iniwan ka ng asawa mo. Or the creditor is banging at the door. Suguro iniwan na ako ni Lord. Lahat ng pwedeng mangyari, nagkasabay-sabay, hindi ko na to kaya. I think God has abandoned me. So what will happen to you? You become so depressed. You become so helpless. You feel all of these negative emotions. And then, you look at the Bible, or you remember in the Bible where it says that, God said, I will never leave you. God says, I will not allow you to be tempted beyond, beyond what you're able to take. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can experience peace in the midst of trouble. All these verses come back. What do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Your feelings that says, hopeless na, patay na, wala na. The world is gone. Or, The word that says, God is enough. Christ is enough. By being filled with the Holy Spirit, you can allow yourself to choose and obey the word and believe the word. So, where are we? Do you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Final thoughts. Just as it is sinful and useless to try to save ourselves from eternal damnation, so it is sinful and useless to try to live the Christian life by our own power.